I'm so happy to be here again with Alan. And uh, <clears throat> the last time we got together, our intention was to talk about creativity, but we never got around to it. So <laughs> because <laughs> Alan is way too much fun to talk to. Um, but but that's our plan for today. And um, for the people who might not have seen the previous episode, Alan, could you just tell people a little bit about just a little bit about yourself and where you are and what you do? And and I understand you have an exciting trip coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I live in New York City. Uh, I have a church community here. Uh, I work in advertising as a writer. Um we discussed last time uh, just sort of me growing up, uh, coming to Christ, like a, a lot of different things, a lot of worldview things, a lot of creativity things. Once again, we always bump into that problem of categorizing exactly what we're talking about because it crosses over through so many domains. But, um, but yeah, professionally, I write uh, in advertising and uh, I also do comedy on the side uh, and do random little creative things here and there uh and i definitely have a passion for it but also uh i think some some unique unique perspectives on it uh and i think uh i know karen's a creative person and, and an artist so uh i thought it'd be great to talk about it uh since it's uh, something we both do and both have our own opinions and views on and do you want to talk about your trip oh yeah uh i mean Sure. And, and anybody who wants to know, it's very, uh, very uh, spur of the moment, but I'm going on a mission trip to Kenya and uh, it's through my church. And yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's one of those things where uh, you often think like, oh, if I'm going to do something like that, I'd, I'd, I'd really have to come upon me. And, you know, I'd really have to have a, a moment where, some, you know, it clicked in my head and Really, one of my friends at church was like, hey, we're trying to do a mission trip. You want to go? And he could have been saying he could have said, we're going to see a baseball game. You want to come? I kind of was like, yeah, I mean, I got the PTO time. <laughs> you know, it seems like something you should do. Um, and, you know, I mean, yeah, the more I've thought about it, the more I realized, you know, just go. I mean, it's, you know, someone I respect, something I, I think very highly of and definitely not like uh don't know a ton about mission trips i've never even done like gone to north carolina to paint houses or whatever you know other small mission trips uh that I, I i've never done any of that so i just said hey the first one will be the big one you know just just get all the experience in one go but yeah i mean uh my church has a relationship with uh missionaries who are in kenya uh and so yeah it, it was a great opportunity and yeah, that's definitely um, sort of stepping outside your comfort zone. <laughs> it's funny, I'm a big believer these days in uh, um, uh, <laughs> like that your life should be made up of things that are very consistent and similar and the same all the time. And then at the same time, be broken up with completely new, completely unique experiences. Uh, I think it's like, you know, people will talk about uh, in their faith, like, you know, this very rapturous, like, you know, intense moments or like moments where it's a crucible and there's doubt and there's a, and then there are moments where they're like, I'm just praying and it's normal. And I almost think like that, those two ideas are meant to go together that it's, yeah, there's long moments where it's very, very boring or it's, it's the same thing day and day, day in, day out, you know, no, you know, unique experiences, but there's a beauty there and a consistency and a dedication and a relationship that gets built up. And then it will be punctuated by huge, complete things that you really can't even prepare for as even as much as we might try. Uh, and, you know, so I think being, being open to both is probably the right, uh, the right mindset. Not that I'm, not that I'm especially, skilled or gifted at that i just sort of like had the opportunity so it's not like i'm not one of those people who's like backpacking through mongolia you know and i'm literally a much more of a homebody so but uh yeah i'm very excited uh be a cool trip one week two weeks uh we're gonna go for just shy of two weeks it should be a great bonding opportunity with your group that you're going with yeah which is a huge benefit of going with people mm -hmm. from my, from my church community and definitely. And yeah, I, I, it's almost 
that is one of the things that even going seeing the seeing people consistently seeing them multiple times a week maybe um you know there still is that there can be sort of a barrier of like the context you're seeing people in or you know oh i'm seeing you at church but i have five minutes to chat at the end and then i really have to go do this uh and it you know just <laughs> when you really have to be around someone and you, there's no getting away that's like when you really really deep in the connection where you actually learn what someone's actually like that's the funny thing is like you know everyone's so busy um you know going and doing stuff and i gotta get this thing but you know if you'd really just pay attention to the people around you there's such a deep treasure that's right there um which you know is always a tension we live live with but yeah so yeah that's definitely another thing i did uh, i told you about it in the last interview but i went worked at and went to a summer camp that was seven weeks long and i think that was one of the biggest blessings was just it's seven weeks you know you're in a campus it's a limited space you're sleeping in a cabin you're with the same campers, the same adults, you know, it's just, you have your, you know, your own relate and all. And when you'd go there every year, there's nothing, I mean, they, they plan on having basketball and archery and, and everything you'd expect at a summer camp and, you know, canoeing, boat sailing, you know, uh, but like these beautiful inside jokes and culture and like these things that take on such meaning and like, You'll make little awards and little like, oh, this guy's the best at this. This guy hit a three point shot from, you know, 50 yards away or whatever, you know, like these. And you're like, all that's, you know, if you're stepping outside, you're like, oh, that's just made up. This is just a bunch of like kids running around in an open field. These things don't mean anything. The awards, the jokes, like they're all just, they're not, you know, you can't go on a job interview and be like, I actually... I made a canoe out of paper mache when I was 19 years old. And that's why I should be the CEO of Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, and the people are like, what does that even mean? Um, but, you know, in the moment, you're like, it's funny because it, they're just so powerful. You, everyone knows why the why the award is meaningful. Everyone knows why this event or the ceremony or this award, you know, uh, you know, this position, this title, you know, they all have such deep meaning, but they're all just, they're made up by a bunch of people basically running around in a, in an open field for seven weeks. So, um, so yeah, just to take it back to the, to the mission trip. Yeah. I think it'll be really, really beautiful to, um, you know, just to be in a confined space. <laughs> Maybe I don't want to send this clip to uh, the people I'm going to be with, <laughs> but you know, just to, when you, when you have to interact when you have to, have that level of intimacy and, and you can't just say, okay, see you guys, I'm going home, you know, cause you're living in a dormitory together. Well, and that's not a reflection on the other people. What, what we're really saying is mm -hmm. that we, we are forcing ourselves to open up more and to be more vulnerable and to be more open and more accepting and I mean, that's where the growth really takes place. You you could be with the greatest people in the world or the worst people in the world, but whatever it is, it has to have something breaks, something breaks open in you during that time. You mm. know? Um, so I happened upon, a, I've been cleaning out um, closets and bookcases and stuff. And I happened upon one of my art journals from, this one's like from 15 years ago. You can see all the post-its in there. <laughs> it's really a mess. But um, I had been using it as a morning journal at the same time. And I, and I saw this quote in here today. And I thought, well, this is really good. It's from C.S. Lewis. The value of myth is that it takes all the things we know and restores to them the rich significance which has been hidden by the veil of familiarity. And as you were talking about being out in the field and throwing the ball around and making a paper mm -hmm. mache canoe and all these things, they have a veil of familiarity. And mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're all the things that we know that happen every day. And yet there's something about the way that myth can take that and restore the rich significance. And the note I made for myself at the bottom is, Example of all the things we know, for me at that time, it was washing dishes. 
the rich significance of washing dishes. It is a battlefield for my heart. Will I wash dishes as a gift to those I serve or will I resent the time spent? Will it be an opportunity to occupy my mind with thankfulness and prayer for others or an opportunity to um, zone out with an empty mind and a bitter heart? It is a battle for a part of me each and every time I wash dishes. And, and I think that's true of anything that we do that has that veil of familiarity. It can always be that battle. I'm with somebody I don't know very well and I feel uncomfortable and maybe I want to zone out with my phone or do I want to open up and see who they are and listen? Mm. It's, it's every single thing that has that veil of familiarity can have a rich significance depending on how we approach it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, and I think um, I think this is another way in which um, sort of ceremony and tradition also play a role because as much as we think we're going to fight on the battleground, I think that um, we need those those reminders that that the effort we're giving that that when we fight on the battleground that it's being recognized, and of course we can't always. We can't always be recognized exactly in the moment as we might like, um, you know, think about all the time, you know, it, you know, especially when you're feeling resentful, you can be like, well, I do this and I also do this and I did another thing. <laughs> and there's a fourth thing that I did that no one said thank you or good job for. And, you know, we'll really like, you know, and you can really start adding them up. But and of course, yeah, those things are sort of lost to the people around us that you know they'll never consciously think about you know folding the duvet cover or, you know or whatever you know um but then yeah we we and I, and it is true that people make the effort that they they go they go on the battlefield and i just think that you know a way to it's sort of why why ceremony and tradition of thanking someone or honoring someone even though you'll be like well i don't even know why we're doing this or like why does this person bow to this person why do you know why are they paying homage i don't even know these people i don't it's just a title it's just a you know it's just ceremonial it's just because all those those fights are always happening you know and like people are choosing to engage in those little little battles that no one will really ever see except uh, often the the first person perspective the person who chooses to say hello to do the dishes well um but when you when you are able to honor the title honor the you know of dishwasher like oh you know like even just that person can have a level of respect the way that they're treated um you know uh the level of um like i mean i'm gonna use the summer camp again but randomly throughout they would have women uh or men uh but often women come and do be the dishwasher literally they're just their job was to wash dishes at the summer camp and they were like come from eastern europe often and you know they sort of became part of the camp but really their job was to wash the dishes is you know um they weren't counselors they weren't campers they, they were in this other you know zone of professionals but, you know, throughout the summer, the director of the camp would just say like, oh, you know, like, thank you to the dishwashing crew, have them come out. And then everyone would give them applause. And in some sense, it's a little weird because it's like, well, they didn't do anything different today. This is what they always do. But just even that level of like, oh, we have appreciation for you. And maybe that day wasn't even particularly difficult or maybe it was particularly difficult. But that like recognition and honoring of that identity, that title that like you are in this position at the camp, you know, it, uh, sorry. And now I'm off on a tangent, but I want to get all the way back to, you know, it's a way for reifying us because then when we are, when we are the one doing the dishes, we can think, Oh, well, what do I think of people who do the dishes? What, what, what is the construct? Are they a loser who, you know, is not hel helpful who's doing this because they have no talent and they're, being like looked down upon as like this is the only contribute or are they being looked upon as someone who contributes is a part of the family the community the team the bond you know which one and you know as much as 
you know, as much as I'd love to say like, oh yeah, I'm ready to be mortified to my flesh. I'm ready. I, you know, take all my identities away. Let me direct, you know, just see the face of Jesus. No, I don't want any identities. I don't want, I just want direct access to the Lord. I'm like, no, absolutely. I want identities. I want to be respected. I want, you know, position in the hierarchy. Um, so I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, when we, you know, when we honor those people, it then gives us the strength to later inhabit that identity or be like, you know, and, and we see this all the time of like, we'll see someone we respect who does these things. And then that gives us the strength to instantiate their spirit and do it. You know, oh, I, I have a friend who is always help, always stands up on the train when he sees a little old lady. And that, you know, makes me want to do that. So I stand up when I see a little old lady, even though my friend's not there, you know, he's not going to know that I didn't stand up or did stand up. So, yeah, those are like, uh, sorry to bring it all the all the way back to our original point. I think uh, those little battles need to happen and and all the different levels at which they happen, not just like, you know, I think in our society, it's often easy to just be like, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go create, you know, I'm going to do, I'm going to do the hard thing. I'm going to pick up my sword. And, and uh, I mean, in some sense, you'll always have to do that. You'll always be fighting the battle, but in another sense, like you can, you can always be contributing to the proper hierarchy by paying, just even being respectful, even, you know, all those things are, are, are ordering it so that when it's time to take that position, you'll be prepared to, um, when it's time to do the dishes, you'll be like, well, yeah, this isn't that horrible because I don't think, you know, I think of doing the dishes as like a place of honor and respect or, you know, maybe not the highest honor, but as a con contribution to something that I love, um, which makes it a lot easier. So. Well, one of the things I notice about you, Alan, is that you're, you, you attend, you pay attention to um events and to people and to ideas and feelings that are happening and i'm wondering if that's part of what you use to develop your comedy because i would think that in order to do comedy well you have to be intricately aware of your own inner life and um interested in the inner lives of others yeah I guess I am really, really smart, you know? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say smart. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I am more sensitive and interesting and introspective <laughs> than everyone else. You're right. Wow, I really love these interviews, Karen. You really have to have me on more right? so I can... Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I think definitely the, even the, like, really really tiny you know like not throwing away sometimes it's easy to sort of like um be like oh my boss was mad because we didn't do this right and then you just you just sort of encapsulate that moment um as like oh okay that that's what the moment meant like we did this wrong then he was when you but if you're really sensitive to um uh like the goings on you'll sort of see that it's there's more detail that that that, that encapsulation is not incorrect in any way but it's somewhat low resolution and you'll see like it's not that we did it wrong it's, it's that we we sort of ignored one of the directions and then the boss rolled up his sleeves and showed us how to do it and then we sort of took a short there's all these like lead-ups and moments and triggers and it isn't just, okay, wrong, wrong, you know, it isn't the, like, the really, really high view. It's more of, there's these little things that, um, these little moments that led up to the final result of that feeling of, like, oh, no, like, we're getting screamed at. You know, there's all these, the way in which those events unfold, like, we can, you know, um, you know, it, it's, when when someone does a good impression of a boss or like of a of a teacher or a manager, they always get the little details. Like you know, if the person's constantly like touching their face, they'll be like, "Do you think that answer was correct?" You know, and everyone will burst it out laughing because you get the like, "Oh, he holds up his like hand to his face and puts his finger on his eyebrow and and has these very 
you know, and that that's what really gets people is like the time, you know, not just like, oh, the, you know, the 10,000 feet, like this is what high resolution happened. But, but yeah, so I mean, yeah, just having those little gut moments of, and sometimes it's funny, it's like the moment doesn't like, um, like even when you're getting like, let's say there's like a clear overarching, like someone's really sad and they're crying. Even when someone's crying in real life or like there's a sad moment, sometimes there's like, if you're really attentive, there are awkward moments or there's like stutters or there's funny moments or there's, even though you'd say like, oh, this person's dog just died. So it's, a, we had this really sad phone call. In that exchange, you'll like see moments where they got angry or they like, you know, they're remembering something bad the dog did and they get angry for a moment, even though that then fitted back into, oh, but like, I'm still, I'm still remembering the dog and I love the dog. Like, you know, you'll see these little, um, the way in which, um, the way in which people have those moments, even though it's a sad moment, they'll navigate. And good actors, I'm I'm not an actor, but good actors navigate those emotions. They can go from, you know, oh, I'm was a little, you know, I'm sad about the dog, but then I'm a little angry at the dog because I remember the time he peed on my ten thousand dollar rug, and but you know that only reminds me of how much I truly loved him, so I'm back to sad. So, you know, you'll see. Um, yeah, seeing, I mean, definitely seeing all those like different, the ways in which those uh, situations are navigated, the different like lulls and starts and stops and what triggers something and, you know, often so what, you in know. terms of your process, do you, do you take notes when you see something like that and save it someplace or is it, does it just come back to you when you need it or do you sit down and analyze the thing and try to figure out, well, what were the parts leading up to this that's going to make it funny? Or I mean, how does all that work? Yeah, I um, I guess I don't know, hopefully that this will be an interesting answer, but I'm just such a big believer in like following your gut in terms of like anytime I want to be funny or like I have to do comedy that's like so that's really stressful that's like you're like really muscling it and you're trying to use these skills you're trying to like marshal them and 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 hone them and you know we gotta do this but I mean yeah even like I really can't say that my comedy has ever been like directed I mean I, mean, I take notes if you feel but really it's just in your gut you think something's funny and then uh you know or like there's some yeah it just starts like in your gut level of like there's some sort of hypocrisy there's some sort of you know people are saying one thing and doing another or the way something is being gone about is really like humorous and uh you know it uh um and just like interrogating that and sort of asking why you think that's funny uh and just you know getting to that laugh moment where you're you're laughing to yourself like that's that's definitely the most you know uh one thing with sketch comedy that's kind of convenient <laughs> is that because you're only writing three to four pages um <laughs> just that initial pilot impetus of like though this is funny can get you basically all the way to the end <laughs> And I might like hone it down and be like, oh, this word isn't working or this late, you know, this lady should come in and say this line and, you know, all this other stuff is going to, you know, these few things are going to happen. The nice thing about sketch comedy is you can really just be like, oh, what made me laugh about this interaction? And then you capture it, you put it onto the paper and, you know, maybe you perform it and you realize, oh, it's really what what really stands out is this one character. So I'm going to I'm going to focus a little bit more on her or I'm going to refine it a little more. But it is nice to just like capture it, just be like, okay, this is um, this is what was making me giggle. This is what you know I thought was so funny, and and you know now I have it on paper, uh, and now I can refine it here and there. But it's it's sort of well. So when you um, when you think something's funny, is that some somebody does something and you find it funny? Are you strictly thinking about them or is there also a part of you that's thinking, yeah, I do that same dumb thing and it must be really funny when I'm doing it too. 
you know what I mean? Where, where you understand it better because it's one of your own idiosyncrasies or are there times when it's just that other guy? Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely is. Like, <laughs> I think the beautiful thing with comedy or one thing I love is you have to treat it like you're a third party out of your own body. Like I treat it like I'm a third party out of my own body. And one of the things that I think is so funny is uh, it, like, I'll give you an example. So I wrote the Christmas special last year for my church and my best friend uh, played the lead and he wasn't a great singer and it was a musical. So it was a little bit of like, we're figuring out how to do this. And like, you know, we were like, okay, he doesn't really have to sing that much. We have some really other talented side characters who can do, you know, the singing. But of course we're like, well, one moment he should, I mean, it's almost awkward. So we had, <laughs> so we, you know, the moment where he's going to sing, uh, where tr it, it was a takeoff of the Charlie Brown musical, uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas uh, musical. And uh, there's a moment where Charlie Brown's at the lowest. He's at the low point of the play. Things are as bad as they're going to get. Um, and he sings Where Are You Christmas and the big gag is he starts singing he sings a cut like maybe uh, maybe like eight bars of music and like it's, he's just like off you know he just the, the key isn't right like he just can't get the notes and then we have the guy who's playing Linus who's a Broadway musician we do a big to do we say you know the narrator comes onto stage and says like trust me Charlie Brown we're gonna make it don't worry we're gonna do something and the role of Charlie Brown will be played by Matthew Griffin, who's a professional Broadway you know, singer. And then he just blows it out of the water. And so it's this really big, funny moment um, of like just going from like eight bars of awkward tension where everyone in the audience is sort of like, oh, this sounds OK, because they don't know we're about to replace him. And so uh, so, yeah, yeah, they don't know. And so there's this awkward tension. And then we place them with the best singer in the entire cast then he blows it out of the water and there's such a relief because they thought oh no this is a church play we're gonna have to clap but we don't really like the music like and then so they're half clapping half you know i don't know what to do because i don't want to disrespect my friend on stage but at the same time the music isn't very good uh and then we blow it out of the water and then have the problem so people are then clapping their heads off because they're like not only is the music great but the tension's been released and and, and that was and it just, it was funny because my friend, sorry to blow him up, sorry, Colton, to blow you up, but there's definitely a level where he's like, I could have done better with the song. Like, they didn't put it in a key I wanted it in. Like, it was just hard for me to sing it. Like, and I'm just like laughing my head off because I'm like, you do realize like that joke murdered, the joke crushed. Everyone's like, it's almost like, it's almost like a, an, it was an applause break moment in the show where it just landed so perfectly. 16 bars of or eight bars of awkward music and then like having this guy who's a professional Broadway musician come on and blow it just was that that moment to me you know and I I I feel for him and like I he's my friend and obviously I don't want him to you know to like feel awkward about it and you know he was fine doing it and it's all good um but to me and I'm sorry this whole story was to get back to your point uh, your original point but to me, I'm just like, to me, my comedic brain is like, that is so perfect. That whole setup crystallized so beautifully to have the awkward downs. Oh, the music is kind of really high quality during the show. Then Charlie Brown finally sings his song and everyone's expecting the big, the big song. And then there's this awkward lull because it's not as good as people are expecting, but they're still we're at a church musical. So they're still trying to be nice. So they're, 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 their niceness is fighting with their not so good musicness. You know, and then and then we have the comic break where we switch out the people, then the switch out, and then the guy blows the roof off of the place. People are clapping. There's this huge laughter. Um, people are like loving it. Like, I'm not saying I like that whole moment and the reason I told that story. Um, I bring that up just because it's like to me, even though that my friend was like, "Oh, that was awkward to do," I'm like, that is just. I've been the butt of so many jokes and like, like there's a part of you that just appreciates like a comedic moment. And even if you're the one they're like, yeah, but you're the one who played the loser. Like, you know, no girls are going to think that looked cool. Like you're the one who, you know, you didn't even get any laugh lines or you, you know, the other guy was really, I mean, the best is when I write a, a, a scene 
and people will be like, oh, the other guy in that scene was so funny. And you, when, you know, like, and they'll be like, oh, and you, you had some good stuff. And I'm just like laughing at myself because I'm like, I don't care if I get the laughs or they get the laughs. Like, we're building something that's so comedic. And, and to your point, I guess it's just, you you know there's a universalness that you see there there are these moments that you see that you know are humorous and whether you're the butt of the joke whether you know someone else who's been that butt of the joke you just appreciate like yeah and this is just like a funny humorous moment and whether i or not i've experienced that like i i can understand it and i think uh, yeah after and having been the butt of thousands of jokes and thousands of my own jokes you're just so a nerd to any sort of like but how could like but but you know and then you're just like no the the comedy is supposed to transcend any level of like oh no like i'm so self-conscious i'm i'm so comedy such a beautiful way where everyone can co go to it laugh at themselves laugh at other people um that you know i i just think it uh yeah it's it's harder for me to like really worry too much about like am i you know oh no like what if this person needs to get you know there's not there's not a level of fairness to comedy it's unfair specifically the clown always loses the clown ends up with the pie on his face the clown ends up low status the guy gets the girl and then loses her at the end you know it's there's a there's a deep unfairness to it and laughing about it and being like that's okay and sometimes life isn't fair and sometimes you do end up with you know pie on your face and just being able to be like yeah, and that's life and that meta structure of yeah i don't know i've never i'm never going to be a woman i'm never going to have to deal with you know or i'm not you know i'm not a lot of identities i'm not a lot of things i'm not going to be a lot you know i'll never have to deal with a lot of problems um but knowing that everyone will have problems and everyone will have unique moments where they've felt uniquely disadvantaged or uniquely maligned and just saying like all you can do is laugh about it I think that's like that to me is like such a beautiful thing because you'll see people laugh and you'll see people um just you know like be like yeah life is that way life does sometimes you you know it's completely unfair those are some of my favorite sketches is when one character just gets completely beaten down and there's no resolution there's no compensation the character doesn't at the you know get the girl in the end they don't you know because we love that's the hero's journey is the like oh i have you know i go to the underworld and i you know, behemoth and i slay the 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 you know the monster at the bottom of the ocean and then there's compensation and the world is restored and healed but doing the opposite and being like oh i went to the underworld and everyone beat me up and called me a loser and i didn't get anything and i tried to pull the sword out of the stone and my finger slipped and i fell backwards and you know fell into a, a well and you know like that's also a, a, a realistic, funny moment. And playing that for laughs is like a fun way that we can all recognize, uh, you know, yeah, sometimes life so is- So what, what do you see as the role of comedy then? Um, it sounds as though you feel that that's some kind of a healing event or- uh, Yeah, before we go down like full, you know, hippy dippy, you know, my my jokes are, are healing, uh, you know. <laughs> I heal people with my comedy. I go to the I go to the hospital every day and I tell the doctors, I wish I had it as easy as you guys. I wish I could just give them some pills, but I have to I have to write my jokes and do the work. I wish I could just, you know, you know, do open heart surgery and it'd be easy peasy like you guys, but I just have to heal with my immense humor and good looks. Uh, but um it be it. <laughs> Maybe I used the wrong word. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh no, it's um no no no. Oh, I think goodness. it is. It's one hundred percent cathartic. It's one hundred percent cathartic to uh to I mean I will say like just as another disclaimer, I like you know, any comedy I do, I do truly like anytime I've tried to be like, I'm sitting down and I'm about to be funny. Like you're the least funny you've ever been in your life. But when you just follow that gut feeling, you follow a joke, you follow, oh, I should say, oh, it'd be funny to say this. I mean, the number of times, like even to the point where I've definitely put my foot in my mouth 
more times than I can count thousands of times where I've said things that like, you know, said things that literally probably did hurt, like hurt me or make people think that they don't like me or stuff like that. But even that I'm like, like it's, that's funny. Even if I'm the only one, like trying to talk to a girl and saying something that she's just offended at and just walks away and like turns her back to you, like failing so badly that someone like, will like has a horrific world view of you and all you did was try and do a joke and then you fail so badly that they think you're an idiot for like maybe the rest of their life or you know they they for you know they'll never you'll never interact with them ever again that's like hilarious to me that's so fun like it's just you know because you're like you know okay I'm, you know it stinks it's not you know i wish that that wasn't the case i wish i you know, instead of coming off like a doofus, I wish I came off as a charming, handsome, you know, winner. And, you know, and the, all the cheerleaders, you know, ran into my Corvette. But, you know, that's not going to happen in life, you know. So, you know, it is, uh, to get back to your point, um, yeah, just following that gut and, like, trusting the spirit of comedy. And I really like comedy is just something I love so dearly that, you know, yeah, there are definitely moments. And, you know, it's funny, I, I belong to a pretty, you know, I, I trust it so much that I belong to a pretty serious, pretty, you know, like, pretty, like, you know, people are very serious about their faith. And at this point, I do like announcements at church, and I like make them as funny as I can, because I'm like, even this place, like, it needs comedy, even in a place where it's a devout, and we're talking about the, the word of God, I'm like, people need you know, that, that spirit of comedy is like, there's something without having, without saying like, oh, well, I'm going to use comedy for, to heal people. I'm going to use the, my skill to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm taking this thing I like, and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to manipulate it so that it does what I want it to do. Like, that's not really what I, I think about at all. I just think of, I like comedy. I, I believe in it. I believe it, it's good for people unto itself without, first saying well you know i have to i'm comedy's good but i have to manipulate it to for it to you know be the right type of you know i gotta i gotta you know and you you know you can't you know be all things in all places you do have to modulate it a little bit but in general yeah just um yeah like trusting that like yeah comedy is good unto itself that it's a good thing that people need humor and levity and and then, you know, that's definitely where the process starts. And then generally when, you know, I go into a situation or talk to people, yeah, like in general, I found it's very, very useful to, to just make jokes and you, you, have, you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Maybe you make a friend, maybe it breaks attention. I mean, yeah, that's on. I mean, another thing that I love is honestly being the weird thing that everyone else bonds around is sometimes great, you know? If you're a counselor at a summer camp, your your campers just, you know, they're, they're away from their family. It's a seven week summer camp. They need you to be the weird one. You're the adult, you know, like you're you, you need you need to be responsible and to make sure they feel safe and everything. But yeah, being the one who like picks weird, you know, a great example is picking weird music. Everyone hating the music you chose is great for bonding those people. Because if one of them chose music, everyone would be like, I don't like rock and roll. I don't like this. But if you're putting on like, you know, uh, wind chime music, you know, people are going to be like this lunatic over here just put on the wind chime music. And everyone's like, yeah, why does the lunatic have the music? control?" You know, so I just say that to say, like following that spirit that like, you know, that ethos of, you know, what we call comedy. It just has all these benefits that, you know, when when deployed deftly and when, you know, when you're someone who's done it a lot and and tries not to be hurtful and tries to avoid some of the pitfalls, uh, it just, yeah, it can bond people together. It can make friends. It can, you know, make you seem confident. It can make you seem relatable. Um, it can bond the group together. It can bond people together against you. And maybe you're the weird one and everyone else doesn't like, you know, like, but you're like, okay, well, that's, that's, that's also fine. Cause I, because I'm not using comedy just to be like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm using it purely instrumentally. I'm going to get out of it what I want. It's like, okay, well, you know, I followed the, the spirit of comedy and this is what we got. And and that's good. And because it's, because it's a real thing because it's, it's honest. It, it, you didn't deny who you are or deny who the group was or deny who someone else was. And 
you know, out of that, this weird, you know, but it starts with that commitment to just like, I'm saying this because it's funny. I'm not, you know, walking up to women with like, oh, here's my line. Here's my, here's my one line I always use. And I always use it to make them do this. And I, uh, you know, I want them to, do, you know, and then they're going to, you know, but if you go up with a real spirit of like, you know, trying to be, you know, make a, a connection, then, then yeah, didn't you just trust, I trust in general that it's good. Uh, so yeah, that's a long answer. Well, do you, do you see any, um, crossovers between the the skills that you use or the intuitions that you use in comedy and then what you use when you're writing copy for your ads because that's also a creative endeavor isn't it <clears throat> oh yeah i mean yeah it's uh um yeah as much as i just I just said, you you know, you can't too, you know, go in with too clear of a, like a mindset of what you're going to do. Like understanding that, like what I gave you the example of the Charlie Brown musical, like knowing that people are going to have this awkward tension of my friend singing, not that well. And then at the same time wanting to support him because he's the lead in the play. That was a pretty like high wire act because it's like, this is literally our play. Like, it literally like it took us months to do so to have a moment where the singing is sort of bad and everyone's pulling away and then at the same time to have a moment where i'm like oh i'm going to use that awkward tension you know between them wanting to support and then then the this them pulling away and then i'm going to create a, a moment where we're going to do a switch and then there's going to be a huge relief when you switch out the singers and then there's going to be like this applause but reading people under it, it, it's a form of like understanding people or listening to people because like really knowing oh what will it feel like for someone who's sitting in the audience to have this moment what will they feel in their gut well they'll feel like i want to support someone but i also don't you know i think the singing is kind of bad so like knowing having that empathy having that understanding of people and being willing to like being like listening like and and listening to what you think understanding what's going through their heads as an audience and then knowing how to sort of like engage with that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, it, like it's interesting because like brands, like companies don't ever want to say anything bad about their company. Obviously they don't want to ever, they want to come off as very generic and polished and Coca-Cola and like, but often company or characters do the best when they go through a journey and the audience sees them fail to a degree. Like new Coke is always an example of like people saw, you know, Coca-Cola used new Coke to be like, Oh, we failed. And, and it was bad. And, and, and it was such a big, complete failure we failed so bad and like almost emphasized the failure because they were going to bring new coke off the market and then they put you know and then they launched coca-cola classic and it's like you know and then the the people can sit at their debt you know people can look at the ads and be like oh my gosh the people at coke care so much and they relate because they heard our cries we couldn't handle new coca-cola we needed we needed the original hero to come out of retirement and put his cape on one more time we needed the batman story we needed him to you know we needed so you know it's understanding those narratives that are in people already that people are ready to hear these sort of stories and, and these archetypes and I mean these like honestly mythos these myths like I mean now you have like Thor and Loki in Marvel which is a gigantic you know like the line where myth and story and brand you know it's all merged together you know and and people trust certain brands I trust Maytag as my you know to wash my clothing and I trust oh but I don't per trust Motel 8 that's a bad you know brand and you know, some brands are good guys and some get brands are bad guys. And, you know, this is how I feel, you know, those storylines are playing out for sure in, in advertising and um, yeah, understanding those, understanding how people feel when they see something, understanding when they see your ad, it's going to be a two second pop-up, but they want, you know, they're going to look at it, 
you know, you what, you know, how do you get them to be interested in that engagement? How do you get them to see something they care about? And just interesting because uh, oftentimes people want to, you know, especially sometimes on the client side, clients want to put as much information in someone's face at once. They're like, these are all the messages we want. And it's like, it's not about what you want. It's about like, get, you know, intriguing, like it's about exciting, you know, you know getting people in, engaged with what you're in do, doing. And now, now we have these phrases like engagement and I'm sure, <laughs> but yeah, so definitely like, I mean, you know, that doing a storyline for a joke and understanding how the audience is going to react to a joke and understanding how someone's going to react to a pamphlet that you wrote, like all those are, you know, very, very similar. Well, that this morning I was listening to a video by a guy, I think his program is called Design Theory. But he was talking about the history of brands and that there really is a valid reason for branding. And it was a reason I hadn't really thought about. Maybe, well, maybe I had thought about it, but I hadn't thought about it in this way. Um, in the Soviet Union, they outlawed branding from the beginning because it would give too much cachet to one group over another. And so they were just putting out, you know, the bread was just bread. Mm. But then people go to the store and if the bread they get is moldy, they have no idea who to blame. And if there's other bread that's really good, they have no idea how to get that bread again, right? Because it's all mm. just bread. And, uh, the Soviet Union didn't change their rules on branding until it became a matter of um, life and death, really, because even the the rivets that were being used for shipbuilding were not branded by the companies mm. that built them. So each company had no incentive whatsoever to produce good quality rivets. And some of their big ships started to sink because the rivets were uneven and we're leaving space for leakage in the in the hull mm -hmm. so then they started making the each company put their own label on it so they would know you know is this good stuff coming from company a and or is it coming from company b who's giving us the good stuff because we want to go back to them again next time mm -hmm. and uh, and i thought about that i mean we've sort of gotten anti-brand because for some reason the the system has convinced us that the generic people are on our side and the branding people just want to charge us more money <laughs> but <laughs> but i thought that was pretty interesting mm -hmm. oh yeah no i mean yeah <laughs> but yeah there's a reason why it, it exists and yeah i think i think a lot of the deep reasons for something and get lost but yeah i mean that level of trust and and um uh, my dad talks about how my grandpa was a traveling salesman uh you know in i guess uh, post-world war ii america and yeah he was like relieved when he saw brands like you know you go to a town you've never been to before you're probably happy to see a hotel brand you've seen before to see even a mcdonald's as as horrible we're all like a mcdonald's is poison you know it's like yeah well you know <laughs> the diner down the street might literally serve you poison because they don't you know they don't uh throw out their meat when it's expired they serve it to you anyway but at least it, you know at a restaurant where i know the brand I can feel more confident in the quality of the food and they, they have a more of an incentive to serve me good quality. Um, you know, now with, it's easy with Google, with Google reviews and, Oh, this local little chain, you know, mm -hmm. it's so, you know, it's the, it's the place to go, but you know, anyone who's been to multiple rooms, you know, we all have our local favorites because we're like, yeah, cause that's actually good. And all the other restaurants I don't go to, even though maybe there's a dozen restaurants nearby, but I go mm -hmm. to three regularly because they're the ones who have the good stuff. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, I totally, I love stories like that, but yeah, it's definitely branding and identity. It goes back to identity and you relate to something, you know, you, you, you know, you have that brand, you have the, I'm a this, I'm a that. So it's very fascinating. Well, so you said you wanted to talk about creativity in general today. Was there a particular aspect of it you wanted to talk about? Yeah, there's a, I mean, yeah, there's a, <laughs> well, I'm going to tell people why they're doing creativity wrong. 
uh, <laughs> and why oh, I'm going to fix all that. No, I, <laughs> no, it's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely wanted to just talk about it in general. And, uh, but I think recently, and this is a strong opinion, but just having retooled my own comedy and I've sort of pulled back a little bit. So, you know, I guess the high watermark for comedy was in New York city. There are a couple of theaters. Um, there are a couple of comedy theaters who do a lot of improv and sketch. Um, hey, people might know UCB, Amy Poehler, Tina Fey came out of there. Um, but uh, a similar one that, that uh, sort of was a spinoff of, uh, some of the people from UCB was called People's Improv Theater or The Pit. And uh, I was on a house team there. So that's like the biggest, you know, the biggest claim to fame I have. But, you know, having done that and then COVID and a bunch of other stuff, you know, coming to faith, all this sort of stuff happened. And as much as I completely love comedy and creativity and, you know, have found a way to make it into my career. Yeah, I think a big part that my one of the insights one of the you know the bold insights that i have one of my many many bold insights which is why you love having me on your show karen is because of my bold insights <laughs> um <laughs> is um yeah it, it's just also taking the temperature down on creativity i feel like it's so people are so tempted to look to have an identity in creativity to be like, I am a creative, I matter, I'm important, listen to me, pay attention to me, subscribe to my YouTube channel, give me your engagement, give me your likes, you know, I have a Patreon as well. And we're sort of, especially in an era where fewer and fewer people are making the content that's creative, because, you know, I can watch, you know, the greatest, you know, I only on my you know feed in Instagram and YouTube, I only have to see a tiny, tiny fraction of people you know, and yet people think like, well, I'm going to be the one who creates the the next beautiful, amazing thing for millions, which also at the same time is incredible and beautiful, but also is completely palatable to billions of people. So it's like, OK, so it's going to be beautiful and unbelievable, but have complete mass appeal, completely generic so that even people who don't even speak the same language as me will love it. You know, it's like, OK, that's, you know, I think, you know. I think having done comedy at a high, semi high level, um, it, uh, you know, it opened my mind to, to the idea of like, yeah, the idea of being a famous comedian, being famous, like those elements, I think aren't best fulfilled with creativity. Cause I think that's the desire people have to be important, to be loved, to have friendships, um, to make a living, to secure, you know, food security, housing security, you know, all these ideas, people sort of mash them all up and put it into like their dream of being, you know, a famous athlete, a famous musician, a famous, you know, and then they, they leverage, oh, I'm kind of good at drawing. I'm kind of good at, I'm kind of funny. I'm kind of a, a good singer. And, and, and they sort of leverage that skill and try and like I gotta really if I just crank on it if I really just make more songs if I really just write more jokes if I really just make a couple more paintings and I I'm starting to, I, I bought a course on how to market your art I bought a course on how to you know it it I think people are looking to get out of creativity things that are not best found inside of it um and so yeah I think that <laughs> that is definitely one insight that I've thought a lot about and sort of retooling what I'm doing creatively in my life, um, retooling, uh, yeah, retooling that has sort of made me step back and especially being in New York, I think respecting creativity, respecting it because it truly can change the world. It can affect a lot of people, but for as an individual, sometimes what's best for you, the individual, is not what's best for the art. Um, because, you know, the art can demand, you know, you know, the tens of thousands of hours from millions of people. And, you know, how many people are chasing their dream and how many people are, you know, going to L.A., going to New York City. 
it's definitely the case that that's happening all the time everywhere. Uh, and maybe that does make really good art because the the one person, you know, has the best voice will, will be found. The one person who, you know, is truly the best actor will be found. But for the, you know, millions of people who weren't that, who weren't selected, it sometimes is very harsh and very, you know, it isn't as good. So I think separating out those strands of what your creativity is good for and isn't good for and what you sh what is the best use of your time uh, and having that discernment um, is definitely to me, yeah, it's just something that uh, it's hard to talk about because you don't want to tell anybody you should, hey, have you ever thought about quitting being creative? Have you ever, hey, you know what would really help if you gave up on your dreams? That would help all of us, including you, probably you the most. Um, you know, that's not a very popular message. And I think people can often, I mean, and this is what I'm thankful for this, a space like this and and this little corner is because people, you can have these longer form discussions is, you know, I, I don't want to point fingers at any people. And I still think even, you know, creativity is such a beautiful thing, but like, yeah, realizing what you're looking to get out of it. Um, because I think, you know, when you, when you think of it that way, it, creativity then can come back to you and then you can actually like pick up the thing again and wield it sort of more wisely and it becomes a you know you're much happier with what you're doing and you're much happier with um like what you're putting in and what you're getting out of it so yeah just just someone in new york i think that i've mean, seen a lot it of kind that it sounds yeah. like what you might be saying is that <laughs> we need to be cautious not to idolize creativity as the ultimate the ultimate thing around which to organize our lives i mean for people who think i mean i there's there's a whole lot of ways to spin this thing and maybe it comes down to what the definition is of creativity <laughs> but Certainly, if I needed to go out and make a living as an artist, I would be starving to death. Because I've sold quite a bit of art, but even in my best year, I sold ten thousand dollars worth. So mm. it's not, yeah, it's not a sustainable career. Now, yeah, you know, you know, maybe if I took all the YouTube classes on how to market my work and how to, you know, how to pump up my color and make make my art more exciting or whatever. So yes, if if we're looking at creativity that way, but but I also think there's a meta version of creativity that kind of goes quite a bit deeper than that. So I don't know if you ever think about that. Yeah, and maybe it's just where I am and you know, the situation. I just think that this beautiful, I mean, this beautiful thing, this gift we've been given. Um, it, 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 it's just, it, it is already beautiful. It is already good and it is already pervasive and people often, but then want to leverage it and mix it with other desires. And I think that's what creativity looks like. And we sort of just those two things just get collapsed together. The, you know, the desires for creativity to do something for you, to leverage, you know, to increase your position in society or to increase your social status um, gets so entwined uh, where, where someone will say like, oh, well, how many, you know, followers do you have? How many views do you have? You know, oh, someone told me they're creative, but I tried to, you know, and you hear like people trying to suss out, like, what does that mean? You know, like, oh, so where do you perform? Oh, you know, people are immediately, you know, is this actually, and and to a degree, I mean, that's just the way people are going to be. But I think that people, and, and, and that's legitimate. I mean, I think the best art is going to rise to the top. That's part of it. But I think that art by itself, the best, you know, a tiny fraction of art that's produced will get all the views, all the plays, all the, you know, the Pareto distribution, you know, everyone's going to listen to just 
the same few classical music composers who are all dead, you know, Bach, Mozart, uh, Beethoven, you know, they're still getting all the plays, you know, and they, they, they wrote their music hundreds of years ago. Um, so I think that, yeah, I mean, creativity is great and realizing that contributing and doing creative things at a local level or at a smaller level makes it more powerful because you're not trying to appeal to mass audiences. You're not trying to. And I think sort of having tried the, or, you know, been on the path performing for mass audiences, performing in New York City, I did realize like you're sort of trying to gamify it to be as popular and appealing as possible. Um, whereas, and then at the same, and then at the same time, that skill of being able to be popular and to leverage your art it becomes part of your identity is because it's like, it's so hard being an artist. Like you say, you sell $10,000 worth of art in your best year, you know, you need to create a sort of like, well, I'm a creative. It doesn't matter how much I sell. I'm, you know, I'm this great, you know, person, you know, speaking about me, you know, oh, well, I'm, I'm so talented that, you know, that, you know, you create people who need to leverage that identity of how great their art is into protecting them and giving them comfort. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's made me appreciate doing something like writing a Christmas play for my church, not to like, not to say I figured this out at all, but it lowering yourself and sort of, I thought of the metaphor this way. It's like a lot of people think they you know, they've pulled Excalibur from the stone and that they have this skill that's going to make them, you know, a world famous artist, a world's famous singer. And they have this sword that they think is going to like, you know, do all this, this skill. Well, then you're not going to want to go chop carrots with Excalibur, right? Like you don't want to like, you're like, no, this is the sword that's going to part a thousand armies. And this is the, you know, I don't want to sing. And I know so many P artists who I respect and I know are very talented who avoid being in like smaller productions, not out of just like, oh, they're too big for it, but just at out of like, they find it literally hard to sing. It's like the, their emotions are so wrapped up in it because they expected to become a great artist. Uh, and now what that might not have worked out the way they wanted it to. And now they can't even, you know, sing for their friends. And it's like, you know, as especially as a comedian, some of the best work I've ever done, like some of the best, like in terms of how contributing to a group is the jokes you tell around a campfire. The the most you'll ever get people to laugh is just two people, you know, three, four, five people sitting in a room. You'll just, you're, you and your friends will be dying laughing, laughing harder than the best comedy sketch you ever wrote. And it's like, that's creative. That's beautiful. That's good. But because people have Excalibur and think it's the sword that's going to, you know, I'm going to be world famous and I'm going to use my skill. My song, my voice is my Excalibur. My my artist pen, you know, my hand, my writing hand is my Excalibur. And I can't possibly use it to make, you know, to chop carrots to make soup. And I'm just like, you know, like that I, ideology of, you know, this is my way out. This is this is the thing that protects me. This is the thing that gives me identity is. Uh, no matter what, I am, you know, this great singer, I am this great artist, I am this amazing comedian. Um, it prevents you from giving people your gift because you you're like, no, I need to, I need to use it. I need to when my when my real song comes out, when my album comes out, then they can hear me. And but I don't want to sing at the campfire. I don't wanna I don't want to write jokes just for these five people. I don't want to write the musical for the, the the church that has 50 people that go to it, you know. I don't, you know. Um I don't think it's anyone's fault. I just, it, it, it now like sort of pulling back. I'm like, it's okay to be not, it's okay to be creative. It's okay to not be creative. It's okay to not use that skill for a while, but then like to it's what's best is when you use that skill in the appropriate places is when you're able to see the, the small door open and where your skills actually can make a difference and if it's a talent show at your at you know somewhere if it's a small little thing if it's your friends getting together singing around the campfire if it's you know someone's apartment who needs a painting on the wall you know all these little doors that open up where you can apply that creativity but you just see so many uh, and you know including myself please you know I'm 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 the first the chief sinner here um 
where you you're finally able to just like okay no i'm going to use you know this skill i have it's it's not for me to be famous it's not for me to be you know girls to call me it's not you know this creativity thing is going to like actually you know it, all these small moments all these little places where it can be applied i'm going to try and do that and use it there um and that's actually like where it's best served where people will remember for years like oh my gosh remember when we were watching this movie and then you said that joke and remember when we were there or you know remember when we were doing this and we're singing together and you know i mean yeah like i have friends who pull out a guitar and we'll sing you know after you know in random times and it's like it's so fun i mean it's just like it's so great but it you know you know, sometimes it takes someone who's skilled, someone who's good to sort of shepherd the group through that, you know, someone who's, you know, as someone who's like funny, I know that like, it's, you know, once you make a joke, it, you can sort of pass the ball around and everybody can jump in on the joke and make their little comment and everyone's laughing and having fun. But, and maybe you don't even get full credit for being the funniest one there. Maybe someone up upstages you, but you sort of shepherded the whole moment together um, because you had that skill in your pocket. You had, you know, and you like humbled yourself to use it in the moment uh, and not just, you know, or, you know, the, you know, all these different skills. I just, uh, yeah, I think that that's the, that's the part that, that connects people, that brings people together, that people every, you know, in a group can be affected by it versus like, I'm going to write a song where, you know, 4.5 billion people all enjoy it. And all the lyrics are super generic and, you know, it's, you know, I think, uh, so yeah, I don't know. That was definitely, you know, an insight that I, I had and I feel like I've been wrestling with for the past couple months, uh, if not years. So, yeah, I think um, it's helped me better understand what the purpose and use of creativity is uh, and, you know, what 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 should we do with our gifts? Yeah, one of the things my uh, my creativity teacher used to always say is that um oh boy i just lost it oh that you can't expect every single work to be a masterpiece it's all about the brush mileage you just keep putting in the brush mileage and once in a while something will show up but mm. you can't make it show up and you can't demand that it show up. And maybe one out of every hundred paintings will be worth something. <laughs> but you have to paint the other 99 in order to get to that one. You can't just mm -hmm. sit around and wait for number 100. You've got to put in the brush mileage. And uh, I'm sure it's the same way with comedy. You just have to put in the time, put mm -hmm. in the effort. Um, once in a while, I see some of these movies about comedians and they're sitting there with their little joke cards <laughs> they've got so many joke cards you know um and they try them out on audiences and and they don't all land you know um mm -hmm. now i'm sure ske sketch comedy is different than that right because you're not expecting a joke to land but you're, you're setting up the whole environment yeah oh yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah 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 sketch comedy uh for sure i mean that's the painful part is you know the the nice part is if, if people like the premise of the sketch if they sort of oh you know the joke is that you know he's a police officer but his hands are replaced with spatulas so you know he can't get the gun and he can't you know he can't write a ticket you know whatever whatever the joke is um you know it uh but you <laughs> so that's absolutely true you don't have the like cycling of like that didn't, didn't work that one didn't work this one did work that one didn't work um but yeah the funny part is, is if people don't buy into the premise <laughs> then you're really sort of a, up a, up a creek um so you, you have to like have more yeah sketch comedy um having that insight of what the premise is and what the thing they're going to getting everyone onto the bus and getting everybody onto the, onto the idea together. That's much more important than any one joke. Um, so yeah, 
the uh, understanding that you're communicating. Okay, the joke is this. This is this is what's funny about this situation. You know, I'm on a date with a werewolf. I'm, you know, I'm this. I'm that. You know, Barack Obama's. You know, is a uh, you know training for the Olympics. You know, whatever that is. Um, <laughs> you know, getting everybody. And that's why I think temporal comedy, you know, there's almost a, such a lower bar when you see a joke that is related to the news because um, everyone's on the same page. Everyone just heard a story of like, oh, yeah, you know, there's a big fire in, you know, in a in Chicago, you know, whatever it is. Everyone kn knows that everyone's seen that on the news. And then when, you know, then you can sort of like rattle off the jokes because everyone's already bought in like, oh, this just happened. Versus if you're doing like, you know, Barack Obama training for the Olympics or whatever the joke is, you have to sort of, commu you know, think to yourself like, oh, is Barack Obama still relevant? Do people still, is the Olympic, did the Olymp when was the last time we had the Olympics? Are people thinking about the Olympics? Are they, you know, is this something they'd care about? You know, um, but yeah, I think uh, that's to me the importance of that, that gut feeling we talked about earlier of like, when you have an awkward moment or you have like, you see something happen that's humorous, um, you have it in your gut because you're like, okay, if I had that feeling in my gut right when that moment happened, I bet a lot of other people have also had that moment happen to them. You know, they felt like, oh, they were under, you know, they, they came to an event and they were underdressed, you know, they're at a funeral and they wore a button down, but everyone's in suits. And, you know, that, that moment they, you know, you have it and you're like, okay, okay. I think this is a universal or semi-universal experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, 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 there's definitely that 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 difference in uh, stand-up comedy and sketch comedy. Well, this has been super cool. Um, it's been fun talking with you about this stuff. I am. It's late in the day for me here. <laughs> it's later in the day for you there, but um, but it's about time that I need to go get started cooking dinner. So um, yeah. So was there one last thing you wanted to say about creativity before we sign off or? Yeah, definitely just, you know, give up on your dreams, make room. <laughs> I'm trying to get people so I can be famous. This is why I came on. Everyone else <laughs> needs to stop making good art. So I can be the one who becomes guys. If everyone in the corner stopped doing creativity, but me, I think there'd be enough energy behind me for me to finally be me to finally crack a thousand followers on Twitter. All right, guys. So <laughs> No, I, I, you know, I think, uh, yeah, no, I, I think, yeah, my big, biggest takeaway would be whatever your skill is, look for like a very, very small doorway to make a contribution, whether it's giving your friend a painting so they can put it on their really poorly decorated apartment wall, you know, you know, going to, you know, sing with a group of people, even though, you know, you don't want to, you know, if you're the one who knows how to play guitar, you know, singing in the worship at your church, you know, these small doors that people will be like, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to do that. Cause I, you know, I want to sing in the recording booth and make my album. I, I don't want to, I don't want to make jokes during announcements at church. Cause I'm going to be a famous comedian. So that's what I got to focus. Like, you know, creative, create creatives, um, you know, the gifts for everybody, the gift is for the people around you. It's to bless the people around you. And sometimes you're the one who can do it the best because, you know, Katie, you know, Taylor Swift has to write generic songs about heartbreak. She can't get too specific or else the song won't do well in the Chinese market. You know, she can't, you know, she, you know, but we, you know, do you want to, <laughs> you know, if you, you, you know, if you want to write, you know, if you have a group of people who want to sing, you know, acoustic covers of pop songs from the 90s together like you know the you know like you can do that you're the one who who has access to do that if if you know someone wants a painting of you know a gr gorilla on mount kilimanjaro like you, you know you're proximal enough to make that difference to 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 serve the people around you um so yeah i, I think that's um definitely something hopefully i as an artist am able to see more opportunities to do that so but yeah thank you Karen well I remember that I remember when you first told your story what really struck me was when you said you needed to learn to um I, I'm going to use the language wrong here I know but 
you needed to learn to look small to to pull back and to get yourself involved with with a local church in a in whatever capacity whether it's setting up chairs or making coffee doing mm -hmm. the small things because that's where we get transformed not not in the big famous splash that we make but in those small things that we do to serve one another and uh and i think what you did what right now with the whole thing about creativity is basically it's the same story right yeah no 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 i think well i think yeah i think it's the it's very to me Peugeotian of like you know these small bodies and and there will be things that grow way big you know there will be but things done correctly small you know are in the best position to if they whether or not they grow big doesn't matter but if they do they'll be good i mean how many stories of rock and rollers going off the edge you know people because they they weren't in, they didn't make it correctly it's not you know when they did it you know uh, peugeot uses the term fractal when they did it small you know what they they sort of cheated to be famous they sort of like let their life go off the rails so that they could become famous or they let the fame you know oh yeah you know so i think doing things small the right way doesn't mean it'll always stay small necessarily but it is if you want to be have these things serve you and serve your community and serve all the different groups you're a part of do them the right way in a small way <laughs> let them serve the people around you let them be done right and you know you know, if your art is taking over your life so much that you can't be a good neighbor, a good family member, a good community member, then you're probably not in a good position to to harness the fame, even if you did get famous. You know, you're probably in a good position for the fame to actually harness you versus the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and that happens to tons of people who are like, I was so desperate to become famous that I signed a contract that was totally out of my favor, you know, because I was so desperate because I had I'd leveraged everything in my life to get the contract in the first place. And then, uh, but yeah, yeah. If you're being, if you're nested in all these other identities, if you're nested, if you already have an identity as a, you know, family member, community member, his brother, sister, friend, you know, boyfriend, husband, wife, you know, if you have all these identities and they're all networked together well, and then your creativity augments that and helps that, then you're much much less in a dangerous position of of uh, of the fame coming upon you and having its way with you. Um, so yeah, I, I I definitely think that the doing it small doesn't mean it'll stay small or it needs to be small, but it, it means that you're in a powerful enough position to do it right when it's small. You mm -hmm. know, so when it does, if it if uh, if it does grow big, you know, you might you'll be able to harness it correctly. Versus, I mean, the story of the you know the how many people in the Bible, the second they get a, an, an, um, you know, a tiny bit of power, it just, everything hits the fan, you know, it just, they're not ready, but yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Alan. I just really appreciate you spending time with me and uh, all the best on your trip to Africa. It's very exciting thank you. to think about. So yeah. maybe, maybe you can give us an update when you get back. Yeah. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll send you for the show notes. Um, Hopefully, by the time this comes out, the uh, the play, I'll send you the detail. Uh, maybe you can put that in the description of the show. If you, it'll be able to, the church play. If there's anybody at mm -hmm. uh, who watches this in New York City, I think it'd be cool to have them come out, say hi to me. I'm working on it this year. So it'll be this this December. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, um, you're working on the Christmas play again for this year. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, terrific! So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll uh, I'll send you the link. Uh, yeah, because this will this will come out probably in early November, so that'd be just perfect yeah. timing. Perfect timing, absolutely. All right, great. Okay. Uh, see you, Karen. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. Have a great evening. Have a good one. Bye.